So many have fallen on hard times, and there are bad guys out there trying to take advantage. We're here to tell your stories. That's why we need your help. So many of our investigations started with an email from a viewer like you. So if you see something that needs to be investigated, or you're looking for justice long overdue, contact the local four defendants. In times like this, investigative reporting has never been so important. Fifty-five-year-old Joanne Matuk Romaine left this Gross Point Farms church on a cold night in January of 2010, never to be seen alive again. Did she have enemies? Well, according to Joanne's daughters, Joanne was fearful of her cousin, Tim Matuk, after a heated conversation they had on the phone weeks before she died. According to court records, Joanne told a paralegal, Tim Matuk said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. According to tape depositions, Tim Matuk's name was brought to the attention of Michigan State Police after Joanne's death. So did you conduct interviews of, of Tim Matuk and the other person that was mentioned? No. And is there a reason for that? Yes, because in assessment of the case, I asked him what resources did he need. He said the interviews of those individuals basically to, to clear them or, you know, uh, with the kid with the case or the allegations or something to that effect and the terminology that clear I, I, I said we, we don't clear people who used the term clear you or him Pazahowski did Pazahowski asked you to clear Tim Matuk yeah. and this other person yeah Pachowski is Andrew Pachowski at that time head of Gross Point Woods Detective Bureau he has since become the public safety director in Huntington Woods Andrew Pachowski was unwilling to talk to me about this case. Meantime, Tim Matuk was never interviewed as a suspect in the case, never charged, but has always been a constant target of Joanne's daughters. Tonight, he's breaking his silence, talking about the accusation he killed his cousin. What made you decide you want to talk? Well, now that the lawsuits are over, and there's really nothing more for me except for trying to clear my name and my reputation. I mean, they've uh, tried desperately to ruin my career. 64-year-old Tim Matuk is an investigator for Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy's office. He's worked on many notable cases. Back in 2010, Tim was a detective for Harper Woods Police. I'm a hardworking family man. I've been in law enforcement for over 36 years, 37 years now. And, uh, you know, I have uh, a beautiful family. He says his image has been tarnished because of accusations of murder from Joanne Matuk Romaine's daughters. This is just a pure and simple evil witch hunt. So tell me about your relationship with Joanne Matuk. You know, I've always had a good relationship with Joanne Matuk. As kids growing up, she was a little bit older than me. But as we grew older and went off and got married and had families, we kind of went our separate ways, just like I did with most of the cousins. You know, I, I never knew till recently that she had an issue with me. I never thought we had an issue. That's why I made that phone call to ask her, why would she go say that? Remember, we told you about that phone call Tim and Joanne had a few weeks before she died from the perspective of Joanne's daughters. Kelly and Michelle Romaine recall the conversation they had with their mother in mid-December of 2009. They told police her mother was talking to her cousin Tim Matuk on the phone that day while they were in the room. We all of a sudden just hear her yelling, like, at this person. We're like, well, what the heck's going on? And she's like, you need to, she, I never said you were the root of everyone's problems. I told you to keep your nose out of everyone's business. Joanne hung up giving that warning. You know, if something happens, look to Tim. Michelle said her mother never gave her specific details, but was worried. I do have to ask about that phone call mm -hmm. because that's where this whole story starts. Yep. What was that phone call about? She had walked into the store that the family owned at the time and told my cousin Billy that I was the reason that John Matuk was having all these problems. For whatever reason, he would always blame me for any of his business failures. Remember, John Matuk was Joanne's brother, who was convicted of writing bad checks as well as false pretenses. 
mean, I've never done nothing to her, and I've not, never done nothing to him. But apparently, their feeling was, my involvement in law enforcement must have been the reason. I don't know. Other than that, I can't explain it. So when you picked up the phone and called her, why were you calling her? To ask her why she said that. And what did you say? I said, Joanne, why would you go around telling people that I'm the reason why John Matuk has so many problems? She responded, she didn't want to talk to me, and that I was a troublemaker, and she hung up the phone. I mean, the conversation couldn't have lasted more than a minute. Did you threaten Joanne? Absolutely not. Did you ever threaten Joanne? Never. Never. I had no reason to. I like Joanne. Now to Joanne's death and the night she was last seen alive back in January of 2010. What were you doing that night? I was working. I was on duty working with a Michigan State Narcotics Task Force. I was in the city of Warren, Michigan. My shift started at 2 and ran till 10 o'clock that night. The police officers in the deposition admit they didn't see you that night, but they were in contact with you. Matuk says that's typical on a surveillance team. What do you say to the family who says, yes, you were working that day, but you were on a radio, no one saw you, you could be basically anywhere in the state on one of those radios? Well, it's pretty far-fetched. First off, I would never risk my job over that. I would never leave my partners vulnerable in that position. And the lieutenant on the crew, he basically knows who, who, where everybody's at and where they're supposed to be. I think I would know, you know, if someone was, you know, shirking their responsibilities or trying to sneak out. Bill Hanger was the lieutenant from Michigan State Police who oversaw Matuk's unit that night. It would be very, very difficult, almost improbable, for someone to be able to leave a surveillance because if someone left, I mean, you're counting on every person there to communicate, you know, and try and track the person as they're, as they're driving away. Matuk says his phone records from that night show he was in Warren. 21 calls made between 349 and 854 the night Joanne went missing. How important are those phone records? Very important. Tells the whole story for me. And what about that eyewitness, Paul Hawk, who identified Tim Matuk as a person near the water's edge where Joanne supposedly went in the water? I've never seen Paul Hawk in my life, and he's never seen me. Remember, Hawk's affidavit was stricken by the judge in the civil case. It wasn't until four and a half years later that he identified me from a moving car at night Tim says and he wants the accusations later. to stop. It's just a constant abuse. It's just a constant harassment. And you just, you know, at the end of the day, I want to clear my name. But remember, the case of Joanne Matuk Romaine is still not closed. From your gut, was Joanne murdered or did Joanne kill herself? You know, I mean, I've listened to so many opinions. In my opinion, there's one footprint, what set of footprints that go down to the water? That says a lot. None return. Now whether she went down there for whatever reason and slipped and fell in, who knows? Signs of a struggle kept quiet. Questionable police practices. There's no sign, no evidence of any kind of violent crime that would warrant a DNA check. Mysterious missing keys suddenly reappear? There's definitely evidence of a cover-up here. This quiet little community has no idea what's about to be revealed. You thought the story was over? Just wait.